So we're going to go through uh, the tafsir of the Quran, inshaAllah ta'ala, throughout this month of Ramadan. And before we begin, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to reach this month of Ramadan, which is literally about an hour away from us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to reach that month and to uh, seek His forgiveness and to spend the entire month, inshaAllah ta'ala, within the worship and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to cover the tafsir of the Qur'an as we mentioned. Now obviously in one hour we can't cover an entire juz. Like if you were to sit down and read one juz or one sibara, uh, it would take you approximately 20 to 30 minutes, right? Just reciting the verses. So obviously we can't go through every single verse that is going to be recited tonight by the Imam and tomorrow night and so on and so forth. But we're going to extract or take some of the lessons that we will cover throughout the recitation during those nights and try to benefit from them as much as we possibly can, insha'Allah ta'ala. So tonight obviously we'll begin with Surah Al-Fatiha as well as Surah Al-Baqarah and we'll cover up until verse number, um, the end of the first juz, which is uh, the end of verse number 141, if I'm correct, 141. Right, so it's a lot of verses of the Qur'an to cover in such a short period of time. So we'll see how we do this inshallah. Preferably for all of you that are attending, it would be nice for you to have the Qur'an in your hands. So that you can follow along, see the verses that we're at, and you know, even if you can have the English, English translation with you, that would be good as well. I know some of you have smartphones or tablets that you can use and follow along, for example, on Qur'an.com. You know, it has a very good uh, translation and a number of different translations are available there as well. So to have the English translation or an Urdu translation or anything of your, of your, uh, you know, your comfort would be good throughout this entire uh, tafsir session, inshaAllah ta'ala. So obviously at the beginning of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with Surah Al-Fatiha. And we don't want to spend too much time on Surah Al-Fatiha because many of us have already learned it. We recite it over and over in our salah, time and time again, multiple times throughout the day. And it is a surah of the Qur'an which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out very simply and very straightforward for us. Even if we were to recite it in the English language or you know, the translation of it, or in any language that is comfortable to us, we would get the gist of it and understand a portion of the surah at least. So obviously we begin the Qur'an by أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek His protection, and this is a lesson for us at all times. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before seeking the cure from any sort of evil for ourselves or anyone else, we begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Any sort of goodness that we want as well in our lives, we begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of dua, in terms of uh, you know, a supplication. We begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see that in Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al-Deen. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioning Him in ways that He is to be praised. Then we say, Iyyaka na'budu wa Iyyaka nasta'in. To you, in you, do we seek, uh, sorry, do we worship? And in you, we seek refuge, we seek help, we seek assistance, right? <inaudible> guide us. Where? Guide us to what? Obviously our goal is Jannah. We want to reach Jannah to the as the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us. Whenever you make dua for Jannah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the highest level, which is al firdaus So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, to guide us towards what is right towards what is the best for us, towards what is not extreme in terms of being too harsh, and what is extreme in terms of being too lenient. We know some people are very extreme in the deen, right? This is haram, this is haram, everything's haram, 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 right? And then you have others that say, oh, it's halal, don't worry, everything's halal, this is halal, that's halal, everything's halal, right? So to guide us towards what is best and most moderate, and that is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu to follow it in ways that brings us closer and closest towards the love and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim 
غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم the path that you have guided those that came before us who الصديقين right the sahaba the companions النبيين والشهداء والصالحين those that were righteous that came before us from the prophets, from the messengers, from the sahaba, from the companions, from those that sacrificed their lives, from those that gave their time, their wealth, their their family, all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those that sacrificed as much as they possibly could within the limitations of the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not to guide us upon the path of those who went astray and those who were in the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Jews and the Christians, right? So to keep us upon the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the path of the righteous, pious predecessors, those that sought out Jannah and wanted to achieve Jannah and strove extremely hard for Jannah, that is our goal insha'Allah ta'ala. Then obviously we conclude Surah Al-Fatiha by saying, Ameen, because it is a dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَالْضَالِّينَ We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we ask Allah, this is a dua, we can say Amin. Then we begin Surah Al-Baqarah. And we begin obviously the longest surah in the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, this is a very important surah. You know, when people seek to be protected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the first things that you should do is seek protection in Allah by reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. So for example, inside of your house, these are from the virtues of Surah Al-Baqarah, from the virtues are that a person who moves into a new house, for example, he recites or she recites Surah Al-Baqarah to protect themselves from any sort of evil. And we see this in an authentic hadith, uh, which is narrated to us by Imam Muslim. Where the Prophet وسلم, said, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا فإن البيت الذي تقرأ فيه سورة البقرة لا يدخله الشيطان. The Prophet وسلم, said, Don't render your homes as though it's a graveyard. What do we do in the cemetery? Do we go there to worship? No, we don't. We don't worship Allah in the cemetery. We go there to bury the body of those that left us and have passed on and went to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't pray in the cemeteries. It's not a place of prayer. We come to the masjid to pray, right? So the Prophet sallallahu tells us, don't make your home as though it's a cemetery, a place where just the dead reside, meaning there's no life in it. He then says, فَإِنَّ الْبَيْتَ الَّذِي تُقْرَأُ فِيهِ سُورَةُ الْبَقَرَةِ That the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is constantly recited, لا يدخله الشيطان That the shaytan will not enter that house. Now I know it's very difficult for us to recite Surah Al-Baqarah. It's a long surah, and we always think, oh, it's very difficult. It's two and a half or two and a quarter juz long. It's really long. You know, it's over 200 verses of the Qur'an. It's extremely difficult for us to recite it. But this is the prime time of the year, right? During the month of Ramadan, what do we do? We pick up the Qur'an and we start to recite. And we feel it's extremely easy for us to recite the Qur'an. And we notice that, subhanAllah, we recite the Qur'an without even feeling we've, we've finished half of it and the half of the month of Ramadan is gone. Or for some of us, we recite two Jews of the Qur'an every single day. And within 15 days, two weeks, we finish reciting the whole Qur'an. Yet outside of Ramadan, for 11 months of the year, we find it very difficult to read one juz for the whole year sometimes, right? To read a whole page, especially as parents, sometimes we put such a huge emphasis on our children to read and recite the Qur'an and to focus on memorizing the Qur'an. And we take them to the masjid three times, four times, five times a week to read the Qur'an, to memorize the Qur'an. But subhanAllah, we have a very difficult time just reciting one page. So it becomes a challenge outside of this blessed month. But insha'Allah ta'ala, within this month of Ramadan, we should be able to recite at least Surah Al-Baqarah within our homes. And so for the next two days, insha'Allah, when you do begin reciting the Qur'an to finish it during the entire month, 
try to sit inside of your house and recite this surah. So try to sit inside your house and recite Surah Al-Baqarah because we just finished you know, reciting or, or, or learning about the virtues of it. It protects the house from any sort of evils, right? So Surah Al-Baqarah. Now the Prophet ﷺ had said, a person who recites it for three days, there will be safety for them. And for three nights, there will be safety in terms of any sort of harm. Now there's you know, different narrations. This is a hadith that has been reported. Uh, but it's not the same hadith as the one that we just recited. So recite Surah Al-Baqarah inside our homes. It's important for us to do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif That book. Which book? Thalika. That book. Now I know subhanAllah, you know some of the... This is the only day we can do this. So I'm going to take advantage. From tomorrow we'll be fasting, so we won't be able to have tea <laughs> during our halakha. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Neem. Before we discuss the second verse, Alif Lam Neem. For those that attended our tafsir of Surah Yusuf that we you know, did quite a few months ago, we know that these are known as the haruf al muqatta'at, the broken or sorry, the disjointed letters. They have no meaning to us. As in, we don't know the meaning of them. We don't understand what they mean, and that remains with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no need for us to look deeper into it, and there's no positive aspect that will come from our you know, debates over trying to figure out what these letters mean when they're put together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, هَذَا kitab, Right? For those of us that are holding... You know, the actual mushaf in our hands, I'm holding the digital version, right? Hadha al Allah doesn't say this book. He says that book, Dhalik al Kitab. Now, I know a lot of the non Muslims, especially those that try and confuse Muslims themselves about their deen, they say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Dhalik al Kitab, he's not referring to this book, the Quran, he's referring to that book, meaning the Bible. And so they try to confuse Muslims and say, oh, look, in the very beginning of your Qur'an, Allah is telling you, God is telling you, that that book, the Bible, la raiba fi. There's no confusion, there's no, there's no mistakes in it. It's, it's, it's perfect. And so here is where we learn as Muslims, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Qur'an, in certain instances, He's referring to it in al-lawh al-mahfuz, the protected tablet. The tablet where the Qur'an has been written by the pen and protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where no human being can reach. So if any person or nation or group tries to destroy the Qur'an on the face of this earth, it cannot be destroyed because it's protected not only in the form of the binding of the mushaf that you have in your hands in the Qur'an, nor is it only protected in the digital formats as we have today. It is also protected in the hearts of our children and our elderly. And it's also protected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the lawh al ma'fuf, the protected tablets, right? Where the Qur'an itself was written and protected from before the time it was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in verse number four. So we're not going to go through every single verse. We're going to skip through verses. So if you look at verse number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ And who believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what was revealed before you, and of the hereafter, they are certain in faith. Here we see some attributes of you and I. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes us he describes attributes of those who believe in him. This is referring to the believers. That we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What came before us? What was revealed to us? And what will come later on as well in the future? We believe in it. We believe in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The good as well as the bad. We believe in all the tests that came to us. We believe in things that we don't see, the unseen, the world of the unseen. In the jinn, for example, we believe in it. And we'll cover that surah 
probably on the last day, inshallah, of this month, right? And so there are many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out to us in this surah. And among those things are some of the attributes of those who claim to believe, but don't. The hypocrites. If we move on to verse number 11 and 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قِلْنَا لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And when it is said to them, do not cause corruption on earth, they say, we are but reformers. We are, we're just trying to solve things. We're just... We're just trying to make things better. Then they say, uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمَ الْمُسِّرُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Unquestionably, it is they who are the corruptors, but they perceive it not. Here we see an example from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He warns us of self-deception. Self-deception, right? Where you're deceiving yourself as well as others. That you think you're doing something that's good. You think that what you're you know, implementing and living by and changing within society is good for you as well as for others, but the reality is you know that what you're doing is wrong and you know that you're doing it simply according to your own will and desires, your own thought, and not understanding the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the difference between those who believe and those who don't believe. The believers, they submit fully and wholly and truly. There's nothing more that they're going to do. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to do something, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We believe and we submit. And that's it. Why do we submit? Okay, now we can discuss. We submit because we believe in Allah. We believe in the hereafter. We believe in the angels. We believe in the prophets. We believe in the books. We believe in the messengers. We believe in the Day of Judgment. We believe in the good as well as the bad, the qadr that's going to come our way. Right? But those who pretend to believe will show on the outside, I believe. But in reality, they think, but this is better for us. So for example, I was talking to a brother the other day. And he was telling me about his, uh, his parents. Right? And this was not here in Canada, this was in another country in Southeast Asia. And he was telling me about how his parents think that it's better for them in this day and age, in 2015, for us to combine prayers in places where Allah has allowed us to combine. For example, Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. So to pray Fajr, because you're at home, it's comfortable, it's easy, no problem. Even though it might be early, it's okay. Zuhar and Asr, you know, we might be traveling to the neighboring city. Not traveling a distance which is known to be travel, but something that is like going from Oakville to Mississauga, right? Or going from Oakville to Milton, right? 25 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers away, not too far, right? And so to combine in times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed to combine, simply because in 2015 life is difficult for us. Really, it's that difficult? We have cars with leather seats and air conditioning and cruise control, right? And we have ABS brakes in case we need to stop the car quickly. Life is so much easier for us now than it was back then. But we feel as though, oh, life is difficult. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all these forms of technology and Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi within our cars and Bluetooth so that while we're driving it answers our cell phone. And subhanAllah, there's so much ease that's been given to us Yet we still think that we can use our brain in order to make life easier for us because life has been made a little bit difficult according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So the difference between the believers and those who pretend to believe is that we submit. And we submit in the ways that even though we've been given this technology, we still know that the, the method to be, or the method for it to be applied in our lives is to revolve around the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to implement it. And this reminds me of something that's probably going to happen tonight. During Salat al-Taraweeh, 
you will probably notice a person or a few people beside you, around you, in front of you, behind you, that are following the Imam using their cell phone. Right? Have you seen that? And remember last year this was like a new phenomenon. There were questions going around the world to different Imams and different you know, scholars. Is it permissible to follow along the Imam or follow along with the Imam by looking into the Qur'an. This we've discussed many years before, right? Yes, it's permissible to do that. It's preferable to listen in and not to distract yourself with holding the Qur'an and flipping the pages and making sujood with your palm because you're holding the Qur'an and not making sujood, uh, sorry, with the back of your hand, and not making sujood with your palm because you're worried, oh, I can't put the Qur'an on the floor, and so on and so forth. But now this new phenomenon, using technology and following along with the Imam, is it permissible or not? Now it's sort of sidetracking from our tafsir, but it's relevant. And that's the point of this class, is to make it relevant and to learn from things that we can learn from the Qur'an and implement in our lives. So if you're going to do that, or someone is going to follow along with the Imam and use their phone, put it in airplane mode, put it on silent, meaning mute, not even vibrate, right? Make sure that you will get no phone calls, you will get no text messages, you will get no Wi-Fi connection, nothing. Because as you're holding your phone and you're reading with the Imam or you're following along, you notice on the top of your phone what happens? Honey, can you bring home a new package of dates? We just finished all of them. Uh, dear, can you bring home the Ruafsa because we finished it all, you know, during the Iftar last night? Uh, can, can you make sure that you bring home, you know, a package of of bread and some eggs because we have nothing for suhoor in the morning, right? And so as you're reading or you're following along with the imam, you're noticing that your wife is sending you these messages and you're wondering, oh, how come she's in the masjid too? How come she's not praying? How come I'm getting these messages while she's praying? Well, she's busy looking after the children, right? <laughs> so if you're going to use the technology, make sure you use it in ways that it's permissible. So you're not sitting in your, or standing in your salah and you're reading text messages and emails and setting business appointments for tomorrow and you're not even punching in your, you know, your code to unlock the screen because you went into sujood and when you come up from sujood now you're unlocking your screen in order to follow along. If you have to unlock your screen, don't use it. Disable the screen unlock, that mode, leave your Qur'an on, leave it accessible to you in front of you and follow along with it. Anything extra than that is a distraction from your salah. Therefore, it might not be easy for you to use or even permissible for you to use. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us. This is the, the closest uh, you know, opinion that is more modern, that has come from the modern scholars. Obviously, we don't see this in traditional times. In the books of the past, we don't see you know, the usage of cell phone within our salah. It's not uh, mentioned anywhere. And so this is what I've got from communicating with some of my teachers and scholars from around the world. We move on to verse number 14, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us of being two-faced. Verse number 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا And when they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. But when they are alone with the evil ones, they say, indeed, we are with you. We were only mockers. We were only mocking those who believe. And of course, this continues with the discussion that we had with regards to the hypocrites. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to safeguard us and protect us from those who are hypocrites and those who have uh, a behavior that is two-faced and show others one personality in front of a crowd and another personality in front of another. Verse number 17 and 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُهُمْ كَمَثَلِ الَّذِي اسْتَوْقَدَ نَارًا فَلَمَّا أَطَاءَتْ مَا حَوْلَهُ ذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِنُورِهِمْ وَتَرَكَهُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ لَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 17 
Their example is that of one who kindled a fire, but when it illuminated what was around him, Allah took away their light and left them in darkness so they could not see. Deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will not return to the right path. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He shows us an example again of those who are hypocrites. And mentions some of the uh, examples of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the nur away from their lives. Takes away any form of goodness. And He removes it from their life, sometimes permanently, based on their own interactions, their own behavior, their own statements, and sometimes temporarily. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that He wants goodness for everyone. And we know that He sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we mentioned time and time again, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That you've been sent as a mercy to all of mankind. But yet at the same time, some people mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ways that they themselves don't want to be guided. They don't even have hope for themselves. They don't wish goodness upon themselves. Yet it is still, even though they do this to themselves, it is not our place or position to decide what their fate is. Even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away the nur from their life, even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps them in balal, keeps them in darkness, keeps them away from goodness, it is our mission in life to still call them towards goodness. That is our mission. That was the mission of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is our mission in life, to continuously guide and try to guide people towards goodness. And subhanAllah, today, an interesting example. I was trying to rest a little bit. Two Jehovah's Witness came and knocked on the door. And they started to tell me the four attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I told them, I said, you know, I believe that God has more than four attributes. And they said, well, we can sum up all those attributes in four things. And I said, okay, good. Let me hear it. And so they said, love, justice, um, I can't remember the next one, and um, hope, right? Oh, sorry, power. So love, justice, I can't remember the third one, and power. And they were trying to tell me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of His attributes and everything that He possesses can be summed up in these four attributes. And I'm pretty sure in some way, shape or form, very distantly you can you know, somehow link these all together. But subhanAllah, right? To show us an example of this and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us about Him and His power and greatness. That even though these people had come and knocked on the door and were saying something that we some ways, the way that they were saying it, we disbelieve in what they're saying. But I still continue to smile. And at the end, I think and I felt that this person that was speaking to me, there was two of them, but the person that was speaking to me, right? I still feel that my behavior with him made him feel comfortable to come and speak to me again. Even though I wish that they you know, didn't bother me so constantly. But subhanAllah, it is our mission to do that. To make people who are misguided feel comfortable and guided towards coming towards people who are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you are an example for others. And even though they're misguided and trying to misguide you, they feel comfortable to come to you. So as Muslims, we shouldn't get upset when Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on our door and we just slam the door in their face. And they hear from behind the door, get out of here, go away, right? We should be showing them an example that, you know what? You might have something to say, but I also have something to say to you. If they don't listen, that's a different story. But we have to try our best to try and convey the message to those who want guidance. They're trying to spread guidance, but their guidance is misguidance. So we try to open the doors of khayr upon them, so that we can guide them towards the truth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 29 of Surah Al-Baqarah, 
It is he who created for you all of that which is on earth. Then he directed himself to the heaven. His being above all creation, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all creation, and made them seven heavens, and he is knowing of all things. This verse is proof to us, my brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the earth, then created the heavens. He created the earth, and then created the heavens. But this boggles the mind a little bit, doesn't it? Didn't Adam alayhi salam live in the heavens before coming to earth? So how was the earth created before the heavens? Anyone? Let me say it again. Oh, okay. The jinns were there. The jinns were where? On the earth. On earth, okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the earth before the heavens. Right? So how is it that Adam alayhi salam was in heavens before he was on earth, if the earth was created before the heavens? Adam was created later on. Allah No, he was not created before the earth. Good. Very good. Sometimes we read these verses and we get confused. Like, wait a second. Adam alayhi salam was created and was placed in heaven, in Jannah, and then brought down to earth. But if the earth was created first, Adam alayhi salam, how on earth was he in heaven? <laughs> but subhanAllah, it's very easy to understand because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the earth, created the heavens, and much later created Adam alayhi salam. Right? In the process of the creation, later on he molded and created Adam alayhi salam, left his body for some time, then blew the soul into the body of Adam alayhi salam and his body which was clay and soil and, 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 and dust put together and molded, life came into it, the soul went into it and then he became alive. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in this verse, وَالَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ Then he ascended, went up to the skies, to the heavens. And this is a refutation for those that say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here, there and everywhere. This statement of Allah being here, there and everywhere is dangerous. Why? Because we can simplify it and say if Allah is here, there and everywhere, that means He's here right now, He is outside right now, He's in another country right now, and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to do whatever He wills to do, right? But that also means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in places that have been created that are not clean on earth. Like for example, you know, places where garbage is kept, or the bathrooms, and these are not places which are befitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say that Allah is above His throne, and He is all-knowing of everything that happens everywhere. In terms of His knowledge, yes, He is here, there, and everywhere. In terms of His knowledge, He knows everything that is happening. He knows what is where, who is where, who is thinking what, who wants to do certain things, etc, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing, all-seeing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, in verse number 30, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةٍ قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَقَالَ أَنْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَاءِ of having a Khalifa. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَعَلٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ But this is 
sensitive now. When we talk about a khalifa or khilafa, we now fall into the topic of ISIS, right? Now, this is what ISIS is saying. We need to have leadership on earth. We need to show people that this is Islam and this is the way and this is the method and so on and so forth. Now a simple question that I can ask you is ISIS promoting Islam in an Islamic fashion and manner? No. You say no, right? Why do we say no? We say no because immediately when we think of this question, are they promoting Islam in an Islamic manner? No. Why? They are killing Muslims themselves. Anyone who disagrees with them, even though you might be a Muslim and you're a mu'min and you're a believer and you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you disagree with what, with what they're doing, they kill you. So how is that Islam? How is that following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And simply by understanding that, we completely nullify the whole discussion of ISIS. It's not Islamic, it's not following the manner of Islam, it's not promoting the son of the Prophet Yes, there might be certain things that, are, uh, that, that, they, that they claim to be good, but then again, anyone who lives on the face of this earth will do good and will do bad, right? So for example, if they fast during the month of Ramadan, great, you're fasting during the month of Ramadan and you claim that it's Islamic. Yes, we believe that that's Islamic. So they're doing something good in that sense, they're fasting, right? Alhamdulillah. They might be praying their salah five times a day. Great, you're praying five times a day, but your whole notion that you're trying to push to the world is wrong. And the method that you're doing it is wrong. And not according to the sunnah of the Prophet So to have a khalifa is important. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He sent Adam alayhi salam to this world to show us what? To show us the way, the method to live on this earth and from Adam alayhi salam and Eve, Hawa came, their children, and their children, and their children, and so on and so forth. And then came Nuh alayhi salam, and then came the other prophets and the other messengers. And at every single point in time, or every single stage in time, there was a leader. A leader who was a prophet or a messenger sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at our time, there's no more prophets. There's no more messenger. So who do we follow? Who is our leader? Who do we look towards in terms of guidance? Does anyone know? We follow the method of the Prophet ﷺ, shown to us in his sunnah, which complements the Qur'an, the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From amongst the people, do we follow people? We follow the knowledge that the people will give, the imams, the leaders, the knowledge that they convey, that they transmit. Yes, we follow them in terms of their behavior that coincides with the behavior, the morals, the attributes of the Prophet Sallallahu but Alaihi no, uh, but in no place, at no time, do we ever fully submit to any human being in terms of them being free from sin and free from fault and mistake because each and every one of us will commit mistakes. None of us is perfect. None of us can fully, you know, stay away from sin. And the Prophet ﷺ showed us the most beautiful example throughout his life. And sometimes he needed the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was sent to him. And so we don't follow a human being in terms of them being the sole person and the right person to follow and we submit to every single word that they say. And this is why in our Sharia it teaches us to question. We can question the Imam, but we do it with adab. We do it with etiquettes. We do it with morals. The Prophet taught us to teach others and to be taught. To learn from others and let le others learn from you. And so when you see that there's a need or a time to share some knowledge with someone, share it. But when someone comes and corrects you and you think you're a leader, you think you're an engineer and you will never design something that is completely you know, a disaster. You will always do the right thing. You will always give the right diagnosis. 
right? I remember I had this debate with a doctor once, right? Who gave me the wrong medicine and I had a uh, reaction to that medicine, right? You will never be free from this state. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had allowed us the ability to question. Not question your belief in Allah, but question something that doesn't make sense to you. I, for example, am sitting here saying something. Something doesn't make sense to you. Come to me afterwards, question. Write it down, give it to me. Say, I know you don't have time right now, I'm here. Take it, can you answer this question for me? Send me an email, send me a text message, send me something. Anyone who says anything to you, whether they're the imam or a leader or simply someone in your community that corrects you in your prayer, in your salah, and says, you know what, brother, you know what, sister, you did something in your prayer, it's wrong, you shouldn't do it this way, the correct method is to do it that way, and you don't understand it, you don't, it doesn't make sense to you, question it. Ask them. Say, you know what, I don't understand. Can you elaborate more? Can you explain this more? Help me, assist me in this. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. In verse number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions قَالَ يَا آدَمُ أَنْبِئْهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ And we also mentioned uh, how in verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names of everything. And the scholars of Tafsir say it's not only the names of everything, but the functions of everything. So how things worked. So this is a tree. What does a tree do? What's its purpose? What comes from the tree? How does the tree grow? The names and the functions of everything. Now this is an important point to understand. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that Adam alayhi salam was taught things that even the angels did not know of. And he was taught things that were not only non-existent at his time, but would come at later times in life. Things that would come in the future. And the scholars say that he knew the names of things that would even come at our time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him the names of those things and the functions of them. What is a cell phone and what does it do, for example, right? This is an example for us. Those that claim the evolution theory as human beings getting smarter, evolving from the monkeys and becoming you know, from the apes into monkeys and then becoming human beings and becoming smarter and smarter and smarter. The question is, how come today, with all the technology that we have on Earth, we still can't figure out how the pyramids were built? If we're evolving and becoming smarter, how is it that we can't figure out things that had been done in the past without the use of any technology, like electronic digital technology? Because they obviously had technology that was relevant to their time. How is it that the mummies were preserved, right? Those bodies were preserved. We don't know. Even with the technology that we have today, there's only speculation as to how these things were done, and there's no certainty. Yet Adam alayhi salam at the beginning of time was given the knowledge of everything that was to come and its names and functions. Are we getting smarter or are we getting dumber? That's a question for you to ponder upon, right? We leave you with that, insha'Allah ta'ala. In verse number 42, we'll move on, insha'Allah ta'ala, because I know we need to finish in a few minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Beware of hiding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us, be careful, beware of hiding or mixing the truth with falsehood. Right? Don't mix the two together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not mix the truth with falsehood or conceal the truth while you know. So for those of us that know the truth, for those of us that know something of Islam, of Iman, of Tawheed, of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firstly, don't hide it. Show it to others. Be comfortable with expressing your deen to others. Secondly, when you know a topic of the deen, don't try to mix it and twist it with something else to make it suit your life or the life of a loved one. And this happens very often. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in this. And the Imam will recite it tonight. Don't switch and twist the truth in order to suit your life. 
don't be the person who turns Islam into your religion. You decide. You make the rules. Because what you're doing there is, you're challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're saying that you know what's better for you and better for your life and your family members and others around you more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful of this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ إِنَّكُمْ ظَلَمْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ بِاتِّخَاذِكُمُ الْعِجْلَةِ فَتُوبُوا إِلَىٰ بَارِئِكُمْ فَاقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ عِنْدَ بَارِئِكُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this verse, he says, and recall when Musa, Moses said to his people, O oh my people, indeed you have wronged yourselves by taking of the calf. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about an incident. The incident of worshipping the cow. When Musa alayhi salam had gone to receive the Ten Commandments, right? The tablet of rules that were given to him to be used as a governance over the people. That they would use that as the laws of the land. Musa alayhi salam was gone for how many days? 40 days. 30 days plus 10, right? He went for 40 days, he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in Jamaat, by the way, right? So he went with Musa alayhi salam, it's a joke, <laughs> right? He went, with, uh, he went to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 40 days. And in that time, when he was communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he left his brother Harun alayhi salam behind to look after the people. And in that time, they made this mold of a cow out of all the jewelry, the gold that they had, but the cow was hollow. And when the wind blew, they heard that sound, you know when you have an empty bottle and you blow into the top and you hear, it vibrates, right? You hear that hollow sound. So they heard that sound when the wind blew and they said, oh, look, the cow's alive. It has life. It's speaking. There's sound coming from it. And so they began to worship that cow. Now when Musa alayhi salam returned, he saw this and he grabbed his brother Harun by the hair and the beard, he grabbed him and he's like, what's wrong with you? How did you let this happen? How could you do this? And so Musa alayhi salam, he simply was told by Harun alayhi salam, I couldn't or didn't step in to say anything because if I did, it would just divide the hearts of the people. And I knew they would listen to you when you returned. So I left it upon you to return and to tell them what was true. And so he did and told them and so on and so forth. But then to repent, to make tawbah at the time of Musa alayhi salam. What time is the adhan at? Not at right now? Okay, inshallah. This will finish us off. At the time of Musa alayhi salam, in order to repent and make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what you had to do? You would seek repentance from Allah but then the innocent people were made to kill the guilty. So they were made to sit down, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the skies dark and dim, and the innocent people killed the guilty people. As we just read in the verse. And so in order to seek repentance, you had to also take your life. And we see this in the other uh, religions as well. It was something that was done up until very modern times also. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to understand this story. It is mentioned that uh, in Tafsir al-Qabari, over 70,000 people were killed at that time. They committed tawbah, they made tawbah, and then they were uh, killed in terms of purifying themselves and returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll continue. There's only three more verses from the surah that I wanted, four more verses that I wanted to cover. We'll do that tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala, and tie it in with uh, the messages, inshaAllah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khayran wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barakatuhu ina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.
والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ما بعد We'll just quickly uh, finish up the last few verses of our tafsir, um, which shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, inshallah. I know some of you are thinking, sunnah, sunnah, okay. Inshallah, don't worry. We will we'll pray your sunnah. We all will pray our sunnah, inshallah. Uh, the time that you finish your salah and remain in the place that you, that you pray, the angels are seeking your forgiveness. So remain there longer, and your forgiveness will come to you, inshallah. We continue on with verse number 67 to 71. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَنْ تَذْبَحُمْ بَقَرًا قَالُوا أَتَتَّخِذُنَا هُزْوَىٰ قَالَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ And you can read through the next verses and you'll hear them tonight, insha'Allah ta'ala. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's referring to Musa alayhi salam, this is the incident of the cow. What is the name of this surah? Surah Al-Baqarah, right? So this is the incident of the cow. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa or is teaching Musa alayhi salam to inform the people at his time, the Jewish, not to be too picky in their question. And so here what happened was there was a wealthy man who had only a nephew. There was no one else that would inherit his wealth. And this nephew of his ended up going and murdering him. So he murdered him, and in order to find out who the, the murderer was, uh, the people were very upset, he was a pious man. So they came to Musa alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam told them, you know what, simply slaughter a cow, and this will be sufficient for you. And they got really upset, and started to you know, question him, and say, why are you saying this? This doesn't make sense. You know, how does, this, how does that solve the problem? How do we know who did this? And so, because they continued to question, they then would ask what type of cow, what should we do, what does it look like, and in the verses we we'll read through, inshallah ta'ala, you'll be able to uh, get the gist of what was being questioned, or what was being asked, and the response that was being given to them. And so here we learn the lesson of not being too picky with our questions. And you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَا تَسْأَلُوا عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ إِنْ تُبْدَ لَكُمْ تَسُكُمْ don't ask too many questions with regards to things that eventually if you are too picky with trying to get to the bottom of something, you realize that you make it more difficult upon yourself rather than making it easy for your own self. Right? That you ask, okay, what about this? What about that? Okay, I need to I need to fast during Ramadan, but what about this time? What about that time? Well, this masjid does it at this time, that masjid does it at this time. What about 16 degrees, 18 degrees, all these different things? How come we're praying at this time, Isha, and they're praying at that time, Isha? Don't ask too many questions. Why? You can ask. You can learn. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't confuse yourself. If you really want to get to the bottom of that or any other you know, question that you might have, first of all, follow your community. Whatever masjid that you go to locally, do whatever they're doing. Why? The problem, if there's a mistake, will be upon their shoulders, not yours. That's one thing. So you're relieved from that. Secondly, They've been put responsible for looking after your community. So the brothers and the sisters that are there that are looking after the timings of this and that, and I'm not saying this much, I'm saying I received many questions today and yesterday from across Canada. And this is a big problem in, in Montreal as well. Yesterday I posted this picture that says Moon Wars. Instead of Star Wars, Moon Wars, right? Because at the beginning of Ramadan, at the end of Ramadan, at the, you know, it's always a, an issue of a battle. Was the moon seen? Where was it seen? What did it look like? Who was the person who saw it? I remember two years ago in, in Chile, for example, the person who saw it, you know, one masjid in, in, in a Canadian city declared the moon was seen in Chile. And that masjid that declared it, every other masjid followed what they had said. But then two hours later, that masjid pulled out and said, oh, the person who saw it, we don't know who they are. Okay, khalas. Now all the other masajid have declared tomorrow's Eid and you're the only masjid that's not doing an Eid tomorrow because now you are not happy with the person who saw the moon, right? So it's not your responsibility as in the regular person who attends the masjid. It's those responsible for making the decision. If they make the wrong decision, it's on their shoulders. And this is why being a leader is not easy, right? So Musa alayhi salam is telling the people, don't ask too many questions. And they continue to ask, and when they continue to ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to make it a little more difficult for them, right? Instead of just going and simply slaughtering one cow, they had to find a specific cow 
to go and slaughter. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in that lesson, the more you question what you're being told, the more difficult it will become upon you. Of course, this doesn't apply across the board. Then in verse number 110, move on, you said that you don't want to take too much time insha'Allah ta'ala. In verse number 110, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says an established prayer and give zakah and whoever uh, and whatever good that you perform for, you, you put forward for yourselves, you will find it with Allah. Indeed, Allah of what you do is seen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in this verse, whatever you do will not go unnoticed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you do. He knows what you intend to do. And this is why when we come to the masjid, for example, for 20 rakah, Let's say we're going to pray 20 rakahs for Taraweeh, right? You came with intention for 20. You wanted to do 20. You told your spouse or you got your family ready and said, we're going to do 20, we're going for 20, right? And you feel, you notice after you know, 10 rakah, 12 rakah, you're falling asleep. You're not even paying attention. You're literally like in another world, you're daydreaming about something, you don't even know how it's coming into your head, but you're in a different world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your intention. He knows what you came for. He knows what you wanted to achieve. If you cannot achieve that, He will reward you for your intention. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Right? This part of the hadith can be applied in so many different aspects of life. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you intended. You came, you got ready, you made wudu, you prepared yourself, you brought your family, or you came alone, you told your family, I'm going to be gone for a long time. But you just couldn't do it. Alhamdulillah. Tomorrow, you'll do it. Today, go and get some rest. Right? Go and get some rest. Or go and make wudu. Go freshen up. You know, purify yourself. Run around, do some push-ups maybe. Go outside, do a lap around the building, get your blood flowing, come back in, and pray the rest of Taraweeh. Do something that is going to get you able to perform it. Otherwise, Allah knows your intention. Go home. Go home and rest. But if you make your intention, you know what? I'm going to tell all my friends, oh, you know, I'm praying 20. And you go home every single day after 8. Right? And you're telling your friends, oh, no, I'm praying 20. Your intention isn't to pray 20. Your intention is to pray 8. Right? And you're just making it seem as though you're one of those 20 that kind of so whatever your intention is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And this goes with everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us He recognizes our efforts. He knows what we put in. He knows what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it, etc., etc. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us here. Don't think that your actions will go unnoticed. On the Day of Judgment, you'll come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wonder, how is this possible? Where did this come from? All of these good deeds. I never did these things. Ya Allah, where did this come from? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you that you intended these things. You intended to help the poor. You intended to feed the needy. You intended to clothe those that don't have clothing. You intended to be good to others. You maybe never saw them in order to be good to them. Maybe they passed away before you tried to rectify the issue between them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you on the Day of Judgment your intentions held down. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in these verses that we'll recite tonight that whatever it is that you do for his sake, with iman, you will be rewarded for it. The person who does not have iman, but does good, and I use the example of the doctor all the time, who is spending their day and their night treating people, doing good things for others, trying to help them, right? And yet they don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, we covered this in our last class right before I left. When we're doing our, our book of uh, Al Adab al Mufrad, that person, should they become Muslim, they will get the reward for all the good deeds that they performed. If they do not become Muslim and they die upon Kufr, they die as a non believer, they will not be rewarded for all the good that they do. Because the tipping point is Iman. You have Iman, the scale goes down. You have no Iman, there's no such thing. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 114 of Surah Al-Baqarah, He tells us, 
ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم And who are more unjust than those who prevent the name of Allah from being mentioned in his mosques or in the masajid and strive towards their destruction. It is not for them to enter it is not for them to enter them except in fear, meaning they don't allow others to enter the masjid to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that they're scared or they must abide by certain rules and regulations or they're simply distracting the people from entering the masjid. They're discouraging people from entering the masjid. And this is a powerful verse. This verse is basically teaching us to be careful of preventing people from coming to the masjid. Be careful of preventing people from coming to the masjid. And tonight is the beginning of a long month where many people contribute towards convincing people to stop coming to the masjid. And sadly, that's the reality. We do always invite people, come to the masjid, it's Ramadan, come and pray, we invite people. But when they're here, sometimes someone steps on your toe. Rather what are you doing? Right? This might be a new Muslim. This might be someone who thinks this is how they have to pray. This is someone who, this is all they know. They were taught this. They don't know anything else. And you all of a sudden, in your actions, the way that we treat the others, sometimes might make them leave the masjid and not come back or go to a different masjid and never come back to this one. So it's important during this month, it will be hot during Taraweeh. It will be long. We will stand next to some people who will smell like Jannah. We will stand next to people who we will wish would just jump into Jannah for a second so they can smell like Jannah, right? There will be people who need a shower. Some people who just showered. There will be people who will push and shove to get into the front row. There will be other people who will not come and stand next to you when there's a space and a gap in the row. You'll find all different kinds of people coming to the masjid for Tarawih. You'll be standing there, the imam is reciting two pages, three pages, four pages, you didn't even pay attention to a single word because you're thinking, why doesn't this person just come closer to me and close the gap? Right? It happens. It happens. We spend so much time during our salah thinking of the person next to us, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and so on and so forth, and we don't focus on what's being recited during salah. Right? So this is the month for us to practice and prepare. And when you see someone do something wrong, when you see children running around, don't stop them from coming. Try and come up with ways that the parents can look after them. Set up something where you volunteer yourself and say, I will sacrifice my taraweeh to look after 10 children so that the rest of the Muslims, brothers and sisters can pray in silence or pray comfortably without being bothered and disturbed. I will sacrifice my time. I will do that. For those that are having trouble parking, they say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice my time and go out there and help to make sure that the cars are parked properly. Right? Why? Because you'll get the reward of not only you standing and praying there in Jannah, you sacrifice your time, your energy, and your spot in the masjid to pray that taraweeh so that other people can have ease and facilitation and make it on time, you will get the reward of yourself and the others. Isn't that a beautiful reward? Isn't that something amazing? Isn't that something that we wish for during Ramadan? Not to be greedy and just get the reward for the actions we do. Why not try and get the rewards for the actions that many other people do at the same time? That's Ramadan. Strive to excel, to get the most that you possibly can. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to try and learn to assist people to come into the masjid and not stop them and turn them away from entering the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the last few verses that we'll take, which is near the end of, of the juz, where we will uh, recite up until today, juz verse number 127, 128, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ
وأرنا مناسكنا وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the incident of when the Kaaba was being built by Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as salam. The Prophet Ibrahim and his son who grew up to be a prophet as well. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ They were praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking him to accept their efforts, accept what they were doing. And look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the direction, the tibla that we pray towards was shifted in Medina from praying towards the north to praying towards the south. Praying towards the Kaaba, the Qibla was then shifted to the Kaaba in Mecca, where it used to be in Jerusalem, right? It shifted and changed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the honor in that building of the Kaaba and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it in so many different ways that we today go to the Kaaba to perform tawaf. We today go to make Hajj and Umrah around the Kaaba. We wish and desire to go and see this building of just simple blocks. Really, it's just bricks underneath that kiswa, the cover of the Kaaba. It's just modern day building blocks. At that time, it was stone that was put together, right? And Ibrahim السلام, was standing on his maqam, that brick that was moving up and down with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he could take a stone from his son and go and build the house and build the walls higher and higher. And they made dua for you and me. They made dua for you and me. In the verse that we just recited, رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ They made dua for you and I. They wished for a progeny that would come, a nation, people that would come, that would continue to worship and be known as Muslim. And you and I today are known as Muslim. And they wish that for us. And we are blessed with it. But how many people aren't? How many people live on our streets that are not from amongst those that can say, I'm a Muslim? How many people live in our cities that are not from those who say, I'm a Muslim? How many people have passed away during our lifetime that we know of that could never claim I became a Muslim. And we were blessed with that blessing, with the opportunity to be known as being part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the family of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi wa sallam, those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who turn facing the Qibla, which is in that direction, we turn towards that direction five times a day at least, Yet we don't realize the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, it, that, it, that that is that we've been blessed with, that is placed upon us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout our nights of taraweeh, throughout the nights that we're listening and reciting the Qur'an to grant us a deeper understanding for these verses, to now make us feel tonight in our first rak'ah after Salat al-Isha, to know that I am facing the direction of the Qibla, the place where Ibrahim and Ismail built that Kaaba, they built up the walls. And they asked for me to be from amongst those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purely and solely. And here I am tonight, O oh Allah, during the month of Ramadan, seeking your forgiveness, standing before you, wishing to be forgiven for all the things that I've done throughout this year that I'm aware of and that I'm not aware of. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to be from amongst those who continue to do that throughout the entire month of Ramadan. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakana nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam.